um, I'm going to wind up posting solutions to these to these written assignments. Um, it probably will take me about a week to get through them all and post the solutions. So you should expect to see the solutions sometime early next week, maybe maybe Monday, maybe over the weekend. Um, you know, overall, people tended to ask questions about two, three, and four. So I'll probably spend some time talking about those in the solutions. With the others, the solutions might be a bit more minimal if I feel like people seem to have a good grasp of what's going on in those problems. Um, you know, so, and then with the solutions, I'm probably, you know, I, I would say with some of the questions, there's probably not a unique solution, a unique way of going about coming up with an answer. Um, I'll probably try to put stuff on there that maybe people hadn't thought of. Um, something that, you know, solutions which might, you know, have some, bear some relationship on, on some something we're talking about right now um, or current in the class. So, you know, just be aware that that will be up there. I will probably make a recording where I sort of discuss some of these things as well, and I'll post that to, to Canvas at some point. Um, depending on how you like to look at things, some people like, you know, to hear people talking about the solution, others like to read it. Um, I probably won't write handwrite the solutions because, you know, for one thing, my handwriting isn't so good. Um, you know, if I feel like I need to write things down by hand, I'll do it in the recording, but, you know, I feel like I'm not going to sort of write all of that down, um, probably because, you know, it might be difficult for people to read anyway. So um, with all of that said, you know, I think people generally are, are doing a good job in the course. Remember today there is a web work assignment that's due later this afternoon. Um, there's one also due tomorrow afternoon. Um, and I think there's also one due on Friday afternoon. So they're sort of uh, all related to the material we're talking about this week. Um, my goal for this week is to give kind of a comprehensive, a reasonably comprehensive account of the idea of a basis for a vector space complete with some examples that will wind up being important to us. Um, remember that a vector space for us, it's defined by, you know, a collection of eight axioms, which are in which were in the first set of slides that we talked about yesterday. But for the purpose of the course, um, it's not you know, terribly bad to consider a vector space as being something, a set of vectors like Rm. So um, when you're talking about Rm, uh, R upper M, you're talking about M by one column vectors and the sort of properties that they have are the properties that we want to use to define a vector space. When I talk about basis and dimension, um, what we're seeking to do is we're seeking to write down a collection of vectors which in some sense generate a vector space. And there are reasons that, that, that you want to do this. Um, one reason is that if you can write down any vector as a linear combination of some subset of vectors within that vector space, then um, there's quite a bit you can say, um, as, as we'll see, about functions in between those vector spaces. Um, so the main goal of this week and next is to talk in some general sense today about what a, what a basis for a vector space is, what dimension of a vector space is. Toward the end of today, or maybe kind of along the way, I want to fold in various examples, which I think people, you know, in the sense we kind of already done, um, maybe an example that we, that we haven't done. You know, it's kind of a nice place to, to also review some stuff. It's true about matrix multiplication, which is, you know, that's always good. Um, and I think next week, the main focus will be to write down some, in some pretty precise terms, uh, the characteristics of different subspaces of Rm and Rn um, that are basically defined by some matrix A. You know, the primary subspaces that we're, that we're going to be concerned about in the course, some of them we've already talked about. In particular, we have talked about the null space of a matrix A. Today, we're also going to discuss, I think, some detail, the idea of a row space of a matrix A. Um, if you go back to the written assignment one, it turns out that problem two on that written assignment is a question which concerns the column space of A. Um, column space is a, is a subspace of the range of, of A in some abstract sense. Um, so for, for today, for an early next week, um, we're gonna talk about three or four fairly important subspaces which are defined by a matrix. We'll extract some useful information, some important information about matrix. In particular, the goal is to discuss in the end something called the rank plus nullity theorem. Um, that's sort of the big theorem, I think, for next week. And, um, and that's kind of where we're at. But as we're doing this, um, I think that it's important to remember that, you know, basically the only thing that's important to us, the thing that matters very much,
is that a lot of the discussion that we're having comes from a discussion of how you solve equations. So it's important just to be mindful of that. So nothing too weird is gonna happen. Um, if you, you know, so it, we're, we're gonna recast a lot of stuff that we already know, um, you know, in, in these slightly different terms. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna start by introducing the idea of a, of, of, of a basis through you know, some interme intermediate set of terms. Um, I'm gonna wind up um, taking some breaks in between to do a couple of examples or have you do a couple of examples. And then, uh, and then we'll sort of see how things go today. Like I said yesterday, um, the material that we're talking about today, I think is significantly more dense than the material that we talked about last week. It's got sort of a more conceptual feel. So we wanna fill in sometimes what we're doing on the slides with actual examples that we can discuss. Um, so I'll go through some things, feel free to stop me along the way. We can supply some examples along the way to maybe make things more concrete. Um, and so let's get, let's get started. So the material we're gonna talk about today, so I had down here, um, concerns basis and dimension. Um, it, we're going we're to take a little while to get there. Um, the notion of dimension, we kind of already hinted at. Um, the idea of a basis the term we've already used, um, you know, but we're going to make some of these things precise right now. So, you know, many of the equations, many of the, the equations that we've solved so far have an interesting feature. Um, there are an infinite number of solutions and we can parameterize the set of solutions like we would in Calc 3. So when you're thinking about that first bullet point, the main thing to think about is we're basically discussing what we've come to call the null space. So I'll write that down right here. So right here, we're sort of describing, you know, the null space of matrix A. So, you know, for the homogeneous case, um, we've designated the space of solutions as the null space of A. We're representing that with a symbol that looks like this, N of A. Uh, and the parameterization essentially gives a formula for all vectors which lie in the null space. So here's an example that we did at the beginning of yesterday's class. If A is equal to, if A is equal to this two by four matrix, you can sit down and construct a formula for the null space that looks like this. Um, and basically this formula is what you get when you row reduce the matrix, um, when you notice that there's only one non-zero pivot, when you notice that there are three columns in which there are not any non-zero pivots, um, those columns represent in some sense, the, uh, those columns represents, represent in some sense free variables. Um, when you write everything down in terms, of, in terms of equations like you would have done in calculus three, you wind up with a decomposition of the null space that looks like this. Notice, notice that the three vectors that you have here, that guy right there, that guy right there, I guess I'll just point them out with arrows, that guy, that guy, and that guy, these all belong to the vector space R4. Um, so I don't, I don't feel the need to go in and do that particular example because we've already done it. Um, there, there's no reason to go back and dwell on it for too long. We feel comfortable, I think, with that example. We've seen it a number of times. We've seen a lot of problems like this, both on web work and in class. The idea is that there's somehow a way of row reducing the matrix. And when we do that, there's a way to discuss what the solution set to the homogeneous equation associated with that matrix looks like. So that's kind of, um, it's kind of it turns out that that's kind of an important subspace. And we'll talk more about that today. Um, it's pretty clear that the collection of all of these linear combinations is indeed a subspace of R4. Um, you know, that requires a little bit of work to show, but it doesn't require a lot of work. Remember that if you're trying to check to see whether or not something is a subspace of R4, all you really have to show is that if you take two of the vectors in the alleged subspace, that the sum of the two vectors also lies within that same subspace. You also have to check that a scalar multiple of an element within the subspace lies within the same subspace. So in the context of this problem, in the context of this question, it's enough to show that any two vectors or any two linear combinations add up to a third linear combination, which more or less looks similar to, the, to, 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 to either one, 
Um, and it's necessary to show that if you multiply a linear combination of vectors that look like this by a number, you get a linear combination back. I will probably leave that as an exercise for the uh, sort of for written assignment two, where you're actually doing this. But I just kind of want to move over that point. Um, you can quickly check that the sum of two such linear combinations is itself a different linear combination of the same set of vectors, and that a scalar multiple of such a linear combination is also a linear combination of the same set of vectors. Um, you can also ask the question, are any of these vectors redundant in somehow? Is the set of vectors truly minimal? So in this, in this example, what I, what I want to try to express with this is, is the following. We have three vectors. Um, we feel like we're dealing with the subspace of R4, at least you know, it's plausible that we can check that directly by just doing some quick calculations. Um, a question is, and so the, the, the question is, are any of these vectors unnecessary in coming up with a description of this null space? You know, do you, can you leave any of them out, right? It turns out that the question about redundancy is, is related to this. Um, and again, I think I'll probably leave this as an exercise for the written assignment. It turns out that this question is equivalent to the following question. Is it possible to write down a linear dependence relation among the individual vectors in, in the set of vectors that we're discussing. In this example, in this example, can we find a non-trivial solution to this equation right here? Um, and so can you find C1, C2, C3 um, that all are not zero so that the vectors add up to zero? So certainly one solution exists, one solution exists. You know, of course, when C1, is equal to zero when C2 is equal to zero. And when C3 is equal to zero, you definitely have a solution to that equation of vectors because the zero scalar times any of these vectors is going to be the zero vector. When you're talking about a non-trivial combination, a non-trivial linear combination which solves this equation, a non-trivial collection of a non-trivial triple C1, C2, and C3 which solves this equation, you're talking about something that doesn't look like this. Um, not all of the C sub I need to be zero if that's what you're after. Um, and so if it's possible to write down, you know, an, a non-trivial linear combination of those vectors, which solves an equation like the one you just saw, then we're going to say that there's, that the vectors are linearly dependent. Um, what that would suggest and what that, what, what that basically establishes is that we don't need, you know, at least one of the vectors. Um, it turns out that in this example, none of the vectors are actually redundant. Um, and we can show this, we can show this pretty quickly. So from the point of view of matrix multiplication, we're just trying to see if there are any non-trivial solutions to the following, to the following system, to the following equation, right? You know, do you have a, do you have this? I think that should be, should be one more zero there, right? Um, and so what I'd like people to do, and just take a moment to do this. So I kind of want to break things up a little bit. The next bullet point, um, you know, it says we can see by thinking about the echelon form of the matrix that the only solution is C1, C2, C3 equal to zero. Um, I'd like people to actually check this. Just take a moment to check it, take two or three minutes. Um, I'd like to see whether or not that's true. Is the only solution the trivial solution, C1, C2, C3 equal to zero? Um, check that, um, take about two or three minutes to do it. Right now it's about 1018. Um, all I really want you to do is, as usual, form some kind of augmented matrix, see if you can solve the system of equations, right, for something other than 0, 0, 0, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I do want to go back and fill in that point, but I'd like, to people, I'd like for people to try first. So what I'll do is I'll turn off the screen, turn off the auto for a minute. It's about 10, 18. Probably should take four or five minutes to, to row reduce the matrix to kind of see whether or not the equation is a non-trivial solution. Check it. It's very much like a problem on written assignment one that I think people are comfortable with, about 1018. Take about five minutes to do it. We'll get back at about 1023. Um, we'll see what's going on with this. We'll check to see that this is right. Um, and, then, and then we'll sort of proceed with this, with this discussion of dimension and basis. Start the recording again. Um, so let's see if that's true. Um, we've got the vector, or we've got the matrix, we've got the augmented matrix. So what people are normally going to do is that they're, ju they're just going to create, in order to see if there's a solution, they're just going to create an augmented matrix 
It looks a bit like this. And you know, without going through every detail, without writing down every detail, this 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 thing that you're studying right here, this matrix via some set of a set of elementary row operations, is really the same as this one. So it's one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero, and finally the last row is negative four, negative two, five zero. So, you know, all that's really happened is I've sort of permuted some rows around and you get something that looks like this. Now, you know, again, with a set, with, with, a, uh, with a collection, with a finite collection of elementary row operations. So we, we transform this guy into this guy just by permuting some rows. Um, what's also true is, is after you do that, you know, we've arranged kind of the pivots to be in the right spots here. You can convert this guy into a matrix that looks like this, again, after a finite sequence of elementary row operations, which one at a time kill everything in the rows of the non-zero pivots. So basically to produce a zero where you see the negative four, multiply the first row by four, add it to the last row, um, and, and that will be the zero. To eliminate the negative two, do the same thing with the second and the last row to eliminate the five, play the same game with the third row and the fourth row. Um, so when you're thinking about something that looks like this, we tend to be thinking or associating the columns of the matrix to the variables. And when you see something like this, what you can fairly conclude is that the trivial solution is the only solution, right? C1 is equal to the zero that you see here. C2 is that zero. C3 is that zero. That's really the only solution to that, to that, to, to that equation. So we verified the fact that those vectors are linearly independent. And so that was kind of the goal of the exercise and, and, we've, and we've done it. Um, so the set of vectors that, that comprise the null space, what we've done, you know, the set of vectors that comprise the null space for us have two properties. One property is that you need all three of them. You need at least all three of them to write down anything that's in the null space of this matrix. Moreover, you can't get rid of any one of them because you would lose some information about the null space. So we're going to come to call such a set of vectors a basis. So we have constructed in this example a basis for the null space of A. The null space of A consists of that column vector, that column vector, and that column vector right there. And we have basically verified the two properties that we want a basis to have. A basis, we want a basis for a subspace, a basis for a vector space. We wanted to have two properties. We'll, we'll write these down in a second. We want any vector in the vector space to be able to be written as a linear combination of the set of basis vectors, the alleged basis, I guess. Um, we also want the elements of the basis to be linearly independent. Linear independence enforces what you would call some kind of irredundancy condition. The set basically, that basically means you can't discard any elements of a basis and still retain the property that you want. Um, you know, so it's minimal in that sense. Um, and so we're gonna begin to make sort of this precise, but that's the basic example we wanna consider. So in a sense, in a sense, I mean, we may not know exactly why, but you already have a good idea of how to construct a basis for a null space. You proceed exactly as we did in the previous example, and that will do the job. So I want to write some some things down, maybe that look a bit more abstract. Um, so that's page four. Um, what I'd like to have people do is this problem right here. Um, so we've already played around with one example. Um, I'd like people to check the following: Is the following set of vectors in R three linearly independent? Um, we're asking whether or not we can find non-trivial solutions to this equation. I'd like people to take a moment, see what they can do. Remember, this guy right here, this is equivalent to a matrix equation of some kind. And, and so basically, you want to write down the left-hand side as the product of two matrices, construct an augmented matrix, see 
see if you can actually come up with a non-trivial solution um, using sort of standard methods of calculation. Um, so try it. In the previous example, the vectors we were dealing with, those three vectors in the null space, were linearly independent. Let's see what happens here. So right now, about 1031, messing around with, with, a, with an augmented matrix of the sort that we're going to develop here should probably be much more than about five minutes. To see what you can do. Um, right now, about 10, 1031, I guess. Take about five minutes to do it. Yes. We could be in at about 10, at about 1036. Okay. So um, taking the time to look at it, let's let's see. Um, we'll write stuff down carefully. We'll think about what it means for something to be linearly independent. Um, so let's see, let me share the screen. Um, so the goal, the goal is to see whether or not we can find a non-trivial solution to the equation that you see at the bottom of the screen. Now, if you consider or think about matrix multiplication for a moment, you realize that this is basically equivalent. So we want to check. We want to see if the set of vectors S is linearly independent or not. It's linearly independent so S, the vectors in S are linearly independent provided that you can find or if the only solution to the equation C to negative three, one plus C two, and one, one, three plus C three, zero, zero, one plus C four, three, one, two, equal to the zero vector. If the only solution, if the only solution to that equation is C1 equal to C2 equal to C3 equal to C4 equal to zero. Um, if you can find a non trivial so that's the so-called trivial solution. I mean, clearly the trivial solution satisfies that equation. When you plug zero in for all the scalars, you definitely get the zero vector. Um, if that's the only solution then, then the set of vectors that you're dealing with is, is, is linearly independent. If it turns out that you can find a non-trivial solution, then the set of vectors you're dealing with is linearly dependent. So the question is, which, which is it? So um, if you think about that equation that we're writing down right here, the left-hand side of that equation is the same as an equation involving a product of two matrices. And those matrices look a bit like this. So if you take two, negative three, one, negative one, one, three, zero, zero, one, three, one, two. So C1, C2, C3, and C4. So if we can find a non-trivial solution to that equation, then the set of vectors is linearly dependent, otherwise linearly independent. So the way that most people are gonna approach this problem is they are going to create an augmented matrix. It looks a bit like this. And they'll try to row reduce it. Um, and so when you're thinking, when you're thinking about this particular problem, um, how would you do it? Well, the zeros in the augmented matrix, the zeros in the right-hand column, 
you're not really having to do too much to change those. You might as well write this guy as one, three, one, two, zero, two, minus one, zero, three, zero, negative three, one, zero, one, zero. Um, you can then try to use elementary row operations to begin to reduce the matrix. Um, when you do that, you get one, three, one, two, zero. Um, you're gonna get zeros here, so we'll try to row reduce. Um, to get rid of the two, you multiply the first row by negative two, add it to the second row, and so on. You get a zero there. Negative two and the three is a negative six. So you get a negative seven right here. Negative two times the one added to the zero is a negative two. Um, negative two times the two here is a negative four. That's a negative three. Neg negative one, rather. That's a zero. To get the zero right here, you multiply the first row by the negative three, add it to the third row and combine the, or multiply by three and add it and combine. If you do that, you get a 10 right here. Um, you get a three right here. You get a seven right here and a zero right there. Um, and so you, you take some set of additional steps, continuing the row reduce. Um, maybe you multiply through that row by a negative one seventh. Um, just a second. Um, so you, you multiply through by a negative seventh, you continue to row reduce. But what should happen in this example is you wind up with a non-trivial solution to that, to, that, to that system of equations. So the reason why this is gonna occur in this example, what you should get in the end in this example is basically a, you should basically get an identity matrix, ones along the diagonal and zero of everywhere else in the first three columns. The last column, you're gonna have some non-zero numbers and some zeros over here. So in effect, there are all sorts of different solutions and you can parameterize that set of solutions. So what I wanna argue is if you continue to row reduce it, then that's basically what's gonna happen. Again, it's a nice exercise maybe for a written assignment. Check to see that you get more than one more than one, um, more than one solution. Um, I'd like to go back and maybe, maybe, maybe I even wrote one down. Um, so I guess, I guess I did. So basically, when you convert this particular guy using the language of equations, this equation right here is equivalent to this. I guess what I'm saying with that is if you proceed to row reduce the equation, you get something that looks like ones along the diagonal, you get some numbers up here. Um, when you think about what that means, that means that there is a lot, not only is there one non-trivial solution, there are actually an infinite number of non-trivial solutions to that equation. So what you're dealing with is a system that absolutely has a, has a non-trivial null space. There are more columns than rows. Whenever this happens, the columns of the matrix, the columns that you, of the matrix that you started with are linearly dependent. Um, so that's kind of where I'd like to stop for just a second. Do people have any questions so far? Yes. Um, just make sure I understand it correctly. So basically when we don't get an identical matrix, so that, that is a linear dependence, right? Yeah, and so if you, if you get a matrix, so suppose you have a set of vectors and you're trying to check to see whether or not they are linearly independent or, or, or not linearly independent. What you can do is you can, which, what you're looking for is you're looking to solve a particular system of equations. Um, we would normally, in this class, we would normally record that system of equations in matrix form. And so you would take the vectors in the set that you were trying to check, write them as columns of a particular matrix, write the supposed solution as a, as a column vector, and then set the right-hand side equal to zero. You can try to determine whether or not there are any non-trivial solutions, whether or not the vectors are linearly dependent or independent, um, simply by row reducing the matrix, row reducing the associated augmented matrix, and then trying to write down a solution in the normal way. So that's all you have to check. Now, there are a couple of things that can happen. You can be in the situation we were in right here, where we started with, where we started with, when we were talking about that null space problem, when we started with the three vectors that we thought of as, as, as representing the null space, 
when we take this particular matrix equation, it is, even though it's not obviously so, um, and when we try to row reduce the matrix to determine something about the null space, we wind up getting, um, for, all, for all practical purposes, we wind up getting the identity matrix right here. When you see anything that looks like this, the only solution is the trivial solution. On the other hand, when we take the four vectors in R3 and we try to, uh, let me go back up to the correct slide. And when we try to, when we try to row reduce, um, when we try to row reduce this matrix, when we look at the augmented matrix and think about what, what's gonna happen, we actually get an augmented matrix. The system looks a bit like this. When you see a system that looks like this, notice that last column has a bunch of non-zero numbers. What that means, what that means is that it is possible to construct not only one solution, but an infinite number of them. So again, this is analogous to what, to what we were talking about much earlier. You're dealing with a matrix here that has a, that has a column that does not contain that does not contain any non-zero pivots. The pivots are all to the left. So this column represents a free variable. And so not only is there one non-trivial solution, there are actually many, but you only need one. And so, you know, you can write down one non-trivial solution just by setting an appropriate value for the free variable. You can write the other basic variables, C1, C2, and C3, in terms of that free variable and that will generate the linear combination you're after. Again, it's a nice exercise. Probably we'll leave it for the second written assignment. Probably, probably this very question. So there are two things to check. You know, so when you're trying to determine whether or not something is linearly dependent or not, that's the check. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that helps. Yeah. Okay. So um, you know, we have a couple of examples. Um, what we found is that the set of vectors S is linearly dependent because we can find the dependence relation. In the previous example, we can find that the null space of A is linearly, the, the vectors that span the null space of A, so to speak, are linearly independent. So these are two, two examples. Um, so some, 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 some basic terminology. Another important subspace of A is called the column space of A. It just consists of all linear combinations of the columns of A. So here's just a quick example. We'll do it, we'll do it very quickly. The column space of this matrix is just the set of all linear combinations of the columns of this matrix. Let's call this guy A. Um, what is the column space of that following matrix? Um, it's just all linear combinations of the columns of A. As it turns out, the column space is the same as the range of A. We'll talk about that a bit, I think, maybe either later today or early tomorrow, when A is considered or considered as a function. Again, we'll get to that maybe at the end of today again. Um, denote the range of A with the symbol R of A. In this example, the range of A is all of R3. I'd like to take a moment to explain a little bit about why that is. Um, so why is the range all of R3? The range of A is the column space, so we need to talk a little bit about why that is, but I might leave that for a bit later because I want to talk a little bit about letting A represent a function. Um, I just want to right now think about the column space. How many different vectors are in the column space? According to, according to the definition of the column space of A, it's just the space consisting of all linear combinations of the columns of A. So when you write that down, it looks like three, two, one, negative one, one, negative three, and then two, one, zero. So um, that particular set of vectors turns out to be linearly independent. And the way that you would check that is you would simply write down some associated homogeneous equation of matrices. When you look at the echelon or the, even the reduced row echelon form of A, what will happen in this case is that you will wind up with the identity matrix. Now I'm hoping that this example is familiar to you because you've already done it. So on written assignment one, that is the matrix that was associated with problem two. So what most people noticed, I think on problem two is if you take the particular augmented matrix, that matrix in the zero column, 
that augmented matrix reduces to the identity matrix and then a column of zeros. What that means is that the column vectors are linearly independent. On problem two, the content of problem two turns out to be the last statement that you see here. The range of A consists of every vector in R3. Why is that? Well, again, on problem two of the, of the first written assignment, what people probably noticed is that any vector in R3 was obtainable as a linear combination of those columns. So in essence, that was the content. Saying that you could, saying that any, saying that any vector in R3 could be solved for is the same thing as saying that you know any any vector in R3 can be written as a linear combination of the columns of, of A. So it turns out to kind of have the same meaning. I'd like to talk about that in just a second, um, but maybe not right now. So again, when you're thinking about when when you're thinking about what we're sort of discussing so far, you know, column space, row space. Um, uh, null space, these are things that we're going to talk about more as time passes, but those are the three big ones, at least for this week. Um, you know, it turns out that you've already talked a bit about them. Um, in the last section, we gave some rough idea about, you know, what echelon matrices look like. Um, you know, here's sort of a fact about them. If U is an echelon matrix, then the rows of U are linearly independent and the columns and the columns which contain the non-zero pivots are as well. In the last example, you might, you know, the one maybe before the last example, we found the echelon form of a matrix. The rows of the matrix are linearly independent and the first three columns are as well. Um, let's have a look at this, being careful to discuss the meaning of an echelon matrix. Before I move on, um, you know, does anyone have any questions about the nature of the conversation right now? There are three major things to discuss row space, null space, column space. Um, we're sort of trying to use that to motivate a discussion of the idea of a spanning set, the notion of a basis. We're just talking about linear independence right now though, I think. So are there questions so far? Remember, when you're thinking about linear independence of a collection of vectors, to discuss whether or not a set of vectors is linearly independent or not, just involves looking at whether or not there are solutions to equations. That's all that you really need to do. If you can find, you're, you're always going to find a non-trivial solution to a homogeneous system. If there is more than the non-trivial solution to the homogeneous system, then the vectors in the columns of the matrix, the column vectors in the matrix are linearly dependent. If the only thing that exists is the trivial solution, zero, 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 or something like that, the zero vector, then the columns of the matrix are linearly independent. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Is this okay so far? I'm sorry, Professor. What's the relationship between the independence of uh, uh, the independence and the column space? I guess. Yeah. So when you're when you're talking about so when you're talking about a, you can describe the column space, right? So if, if you're thinking about the column space of a matrix, all the column space is, is just the set of all linear combinations of the columns of A. That's its definition. Um, an interesting question, if you're thinking about the column space, there are two, there are two questions that you, that you might ask. How many, or maybe a better way to ask this is what vectors can be written as a linear combination of the columns. Now, in the example, in the example that we have on, on this on this page, we actually already know the answer to this. So from problem two. on written assignment one, any vector in R3 can be written as a linear combination 
of the columns of A. In, at least with this A. Why? So when people did problem two on the written assignment, the question was about solutions to, to equations in a, in a particular system. But the question on A was for which vectors B can we find a solution to A x equal to B? And the answer to that question is that any choice of B, or rather I'll say it this way, for any choice of B, we can find X, which satisfies A X equal to B. Um, that was actually the content of that question um, from, from the point of view we're taking right now. Um, what does it mean that that's true? Um, it means that, so I, I'll probably need, I can't remember the exact vectors, but remember that A, you're talking about the columns. The left-hand side of that equation, the left-hand side of that equation is just the first column. It's not a one, it's kind of an arrow. Well, I'll write it this way. Um, the left-hand side of that equation, well, I guess I should say if x is equal to x1, x2, x3, um, the left-hand side of that equation is, is the same because the way we're thinking about matrix multiplication, it's the same as x1 times v1 plus x2 times v2 plus x3 times v3. The right-hand side is, is, of course, b, where V1 is column one of A. Um, V2 is column two of A. And V3 is column three of, of A. So that's, we, we, I haven't described the relationship between the column space and linear dependence or independent yet. I'm just re-describing problem two on the written assignment in another way. So the, the content of that problem is basically saying that any vector in, in R3 can be written as a linear combination of the columns. Um, that, and the reason why that's true is, is basically you can always find a solution. So you can always find the linear combination. Um, so you've already done that problem um, maybe you haven't thought about it in exactly this way, but something more than that is true. Even more. The columns of A are linearly independent. because the only solution to a c equal to zero is c equal to the zero vector. So um, the columns of a are linearly independent and also the column space of a can sit, the column space of a um, is, is all of R3. That's all we're really saying. To check this, to check this. Check that the augmented matrix, when you put A over here and you put zero, zero, zero here, is row equivalent to the identity matrix with the zeros over here. Um, if, if that's true, then you know you've basically shown that that all you have is the trivial solution. 
So that problem too has, has quite a bit of content on the written assignment. There are two things that are important about it. One thing that's important about it is that all vectors in R3 can be represented as linear combinations of the columns of A. The other thing that's important about it is that not only is that true, but the columns of A are linearly independent. So if you removed any of the columns, you would not be able to cover all of, of R3. There would be vectors that you miss. So you have what amounts to a basis for the, for the column space of A. I'd like to contrast that with, with, with one example that we talked about a bit earlier. I have a question. Yes. I'm still kind of a bit confused on like column spaces. Yeah. That's just kind of that. Okay. I'm still kind of confused on like, and then yeah. like, I'm trying to like, I guess like see the relationship between that and like linear independency. Um, but like it's I kind of am so a little bit confused on all the column spaces. When, so the column space of a matrix, all it is, it's just the set of linear combinations of the columns of the matrix, that's it. So when you, when you take the columns and you write down all possible linear combinations of those columns, that is the column space. So for example, We oh, so we have like there. x1 to a yeah. vector plus x2 to a vector plus x3 to a vector. That's right. And the set of all those things is the column space. So in this example for A, the first, the second, and the third column are all vectors. And when you're talking about the column space of A, you're talking about all vectors which can be written as a linear combination of those, of those three vectors. So in this, in this example that, that, we're, that we're looking at right here, the column space of A is anything that looks like C1, 3, 2, 1, plus C2, negative 1, 1, negative 3, plus C3, I can't read my own handwriting. Um, last vector is two one two one zero. So any anything that looks like that, anything that looks like that, anything, is is an element of the column space. That's that's just its definition. Um, now, that's also true in other examples. So we'll, we'll look at it. We'll, we'll go back and look at one example that we've that we thought about already. This particular column space in this example has two properties, has two properties. One of those properties you already know, you already know from problem two on written assignment one. And that property is that any vector can be written as a linear combination, any vector in R3 can be written as a linear combination of those columns. So basically uh, those columns suffice to explain how any vector in R3 can be written. So if you take a triple, it's possible to write down a linear combination of the columns of that particular matrix. And that, that, that linear combination will be equal to that vector. That's the content of problem two on the first written assignment. To be able to solve that system is equivalent to coming up with such a linear combination. So that's the first fact. Now, what we're gonna say with that, we're gonna, what we're gonna wind up saying with that is that the columns of A span R3. That's just a shorter way of saying any vector in R3 can be written as a linear combination of those columns. But even more than that is true. If you take a look at those columns, they are also linearly independent. And the reason why they're linearly independent is because there are no non-trivial solutions to a certain matrix equation. If you arrange the columns and you write down a homogeneous equation involving a matrix with the column vectors as columns, the only solution, the only solution to that equation is the zero vector. And that is because that matrix A will row reduce to the identity. Okay, so is that, so that's the reason why any vector in R3 can be, like it spans all of R3 because it's literally linearly independent. It, it doesn't have to be linearly independent um, to span all of R3, but the, but the column space has two properties and they're, and they're not the same property. One property is that the columns of A span R3. 
And that is the content of problem two on the first written assignment. The content of two is to actually come up in some sense with the formula for the linear combination of the columns which combine into any vector in R3. So all you're really showing on problem, problem two in written assignment one is that the column vectors span R3. But not only that, the columns have one additional important property. They are linearly independent. So you can't get rid of any one of them without getting rid of something in R3. So they're all necessary in order to give a description of R3. They're, they're, you, know, you can't get rid of any one of them. You can't write any one of them as a combination of the others. Um, they're all important. So the column space in that example, the column space in that example, it, is sp it spans R3 and it is linearly independent. Um, I would like to contrast that with, with another example that we talked about just a minute ago. So in this example right here, if you take these vectors, one, two, three, and four, if that's the set of vectors S, uh, and I'll probably have you, have you do this on the, on the second written assignment. If you take that set of vectors, there are several things you can show. First of all, with that set of vectors, you can show that that set of vectors that was on the screen a moment ago spans R3. So what that means is that you can write down any vector as a linear combination of those vectors in S. It's possible. But you can also show that that set of vectors is not linearly independent. You have, you have more vectors than you actually need to describe R3, if that makes sense. So, you know, in these two examples, in the content of that, you know, the, you know so why, why, why is that? Um, you know, we need to explore that a bit, but, you know, we would see that right here, I think, we would see that, we would see that by just observing something about this matrix. So if you look at this particular matrix, the column space of this matrix is not the column space of the original matrix, but it will tell you what linear combinations add up to what. Um, again, there's an exercise in the set of slides where we actually do that, but I probably want you know, to assign that separately to have people think about it a little bit. So the fact that there's a non-trivial solution to this homogeneous system will wind up implying that the set of vectors that you started with is not linearly independent. So in the example that we're talking about right now, the four vectors do span R3, but they're not linearly independent. In the other example that we talked about, the three vectors span R3, the one coming from problem two on the written assignment, the three vectors do span R3 and they are linearly independent. And there's a qualitative difference between these two situations. If the vectors that you're dealing with span, if you can write down anything as a linear combination of a set of vectors, you have a spanning set, but it might be too big. It might not be minimal. And so a minimal spanning set, we're gonna to come to call a basis. Uh, and it's different than just a spanning set. It's a spanning set, which contains in some sense, the smallest, numbers of, smallest number of vectors that you actually need to discuss a vector space. Um, so those two examples that you're looking at, they're not the same. They both are examples of spanning sets, but in one of the examples, the set of vectors is too big. The set of vectors is linearly dependent. In the other example, the set of vectors is just right. Not only does it span R3, but it's also linearly independent as a set. So that's all we're really saying. So talking about like minimal and stuff like that, it's not just a matter of like, further row reducing the matrix or like, or like, is it like, cause it's like a multiple, like. It's, it's a, if you want to, so, I mean, the, the question might be if you have a spanning set and it is not minimal, how do you make it minimal? Yeah. Um, you, you throw vectors out of it. <laughs> so basically in the spanning set where you have the four vectors, what you can do is you can pick out one of those vectors that you can write as a linear combination of the other three. Once you know how, once you know that vector is a linear combination of the other three, throw it out and the remaining three, maybe that's minimal. So it's, it's not a question of further row reducing the matrix. It, it's in a sense, a question of if you choose one of the vectors and if you know, if you know that a set of vectors is linearly dependent, it turns out that it's possible to write down 
one of the vectors, like in that example, as a linear combination of the other three. So that vector that's the linear combination of the other three isn't adding anything to the span because it's already represented in a sense by the other three vectors. You don't need it. So you throw it so out. Are you talking about saying free variable? Throw out the free variable? Yes, yes, that's right. That's, that's kind of how you do it. It's like a free variable. That's exactly right. So when you take, when you take this example right here, that last column is where the free variable is, right? And so the fact that the, the and, and so when you think about that as a free variable, what you can do is you can sort of reverse engineer what that last column is in terms of the other three columns, just using some algebra. And so that last, so what that's saying, what that's saying is that that last column is not necessary. The other three are enough. Um, and so the minimal, the, min, the minimality at that point is achieved as it turns out. Um, you can't, in that set of four vectors, you can't, turns out, get rid of any more than one. But what, what we're seeing in this case, I think, is that, you know, you do have a spanning set in that example, but it's too big. It's too big. You can write one of the vectors as a linear combination of the other three. And if that's possible, you can throw that vector out and just retain the other three. Now it's minimal. So a minimal spanning set in the sense that we're discussing is called a basis. Um, a set that just spans but might not be minimal is just called a spanning set. Spanning sets could be, could be overly large. Um, so the goal of the next few days is to take some of these subspaces of Rm and to try to write down, you know, if you take a matrix A, to try to write down some kind of set of vectors which form a basis for the various subsets that we're talking about. Now, in the examples that we've done so far, when you solve, when you try to find the null space of a matrix A, it's possible to write down pretty quickly what the basis is, and you can kind of show that it's a basis. The column space is a little bit harder. Um, there's also something called a row space. It is what you think. The row space is just the space that is spanned by the rows of the matrix. Um, those rows might be linearly independent or they might be linearly dependent. Um, so, you know, we, we have to think about what a basis for the row space is as well. Um, and there's some other subspace of Rn that we need to discuss. It's not clear why yet. But the big three for us are the row space, the null space, and the column space. Right now, the null space, it's not too difficult for people to write down a, a basis for the null space, though maybe it's not totally clear why it's a basis. Um, for the column space, it's a little trickier. Um, for the column space, you generally have to think about two things. You have to think about whether or not the column space spans something. Some, you know, you know, what is the span of it? You know, if you're thinking about like that problem on, on the written assignment, you also have to show that it's a minimal spanning set, that the column vectors are themselves linearly independent. And this involves sort of solving some homogeneous equation. Um, and so, you know, those two things we kind of already know how to do. Row space is a little more complicated, though. That's surprising. So does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah, so there's no, there's no real technical fix. You know, you can't, you know, with, with, a, with, with a span, with a spanning set, sometimes the spanning set's just, just too big. But at least you can try to throw out some vectors. Um, right. So I don't know that I want to get into that right now. Um, so I do want to describe something called echelon form um, because that's sort of sort of what we're going to talk about, you know, over the next couple of slides. In general, an M by N matrix is an echelon form if, the, if it has the following two properties: all rows consisting of zeros are at the bottom of the matrix, and the non-zero pivot in each non-zero row is always strictly to the right of the row above it. So um, the following matrix that you see right here. Is an echelon form. Um, notice that the zeros are all down here. The first non-zero pivot occurs in this position right here. The next non-zero pivot is in the second row, but that three is to the right of one. Um, another example is like zero, one, one, three, four. That's maybe the first row. Zero, zero, three, one, two, zero, 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 one. That is another example of a matrix which is an echelon form. 
Notice you have three non-zero rows. There aren't any zero rows in this case. The first non-zero pivot occurs right here. The second non-zero pivot occurs in this column right here. It is to the right of the first non-zero pivot. The last non-zero pivot occurs here. It is to the right of this non-zero pivot. So when we talk about things being in echelon form, that's kind of what we mean. Now, it turns out that any matrix that's M by N can always be reduced to a, something that is of, of, that is of echelon form by a sequence of elementary row operations. That's not that surprising of a result because you've kind of been doing that all along in the class. So before we move on, does anyone have any questions about the idea of an echelon matrix? Um, so it's just simply we're reducing it, but not necessarily to like getting like R R E F. Yeah, that's right. So you're not you're not totally getting to to the reduced row echelon form. You could do that. You know, in those examples, you could always you could always multiply the rows by individual scalars to produce ones if that's what you wanted to do. Sometimes it's productive to do that. But when you're talking about something in echelon form, you're just describing some sort of relationship. You're, you're trying to describe where the pivots are at basically, and where the zero rows are at. So for an echelon matrix, matrix is an echelon form if the last few rows are zeros, if there are any zero rows at all, and there's some relationship amongst the non-zero pivots where they're kind of occurring in a sequence. So there's this stair-step pattern in the matrix. So it's not the reduced row echelon form, which maybe you're used to, but it's a slightly looser condition. Okay, so... So how do we know when we have echelon, uh, echelon matrix? Um, so you know that you have an echelon matrix if these two conditions are satisfied. So this is an example of one because the last row is zero and the pivots have a certain relationship in the matrix to each other. The pivot in each non-zero row, in any non-zero row is always to the right of the row above it, the pivot in the row above it. So if you take a look at this picture, that three right here is the second pivot. It's a pivot, right? It's the first non-zero entry in this row. Notice that three is in a column, which is to the right of the first pivot. Something similar can be said here. You have the first row. The first non-zero entry is right here. That's the first pivot. In the second non-zero row, the second pivot is right here. The second pivot is in the third column. The first pivot is in the second column. The second pivot is to the right of the first pivot, sort of spatially within the matrix. On the other hand, something that looks like this, is not in echelon form. The reason why is that in the first row, you have a pivot that's right here, but in the next row, this pivot is still the first non-zero entry of that row. It is to the left of where the first pivot is. So this guy is not in echelon form. Um, professor? Yes. Um, like in this situation, can we swap the first row and second row and to make it? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So the, the theorem, I think what you want to say is if the, what you want to say is if you have any M by N matrix, there is a sequence of elementary row operations, which includes swapping rows. Um, and it, that, that will produce something that is in echelon form. So you can always kind of convert the thing into echelon form after enough of these row operations. Like in that example, the last non-example, I guess, is that you have a matrix which is not in echelon form, but you could put it in echelon form by just swapping the first two rows. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm just, but can you go back so I can just like write the other property. Yeah, so there are two, right? So something is an echelon form provided that all the rows consisting of zeros are at the bottom of the matrix and the pivot in each row is always strictly to the right of the row above it. So anything that looks like that is an echelon form. For example, this matrix right here, the one, the one to which the arrow is drawn, is an example of a matrix which is an echelon form. Now, when you're talking about echelon form, you don't necessarily have to have a number like one in, the, in a pivot position. 
non-zero is fine. So this, this thing is in echelon form. Why is that? Notice, first of all, the zeros are at the bottom. And when you look at where the pivots are, they're in columns which are more and more to the right. So the first pivot is in the first column. The second pivot is in the third column. So the second pivot is to the right of the first pivot, if that makes sense. The same is true about this example right here. If you take a look at the first pivot in this example, that's the one that you see that's circled. The pivot in the second row is in the third column. The pivot in the first row is in the second column. This pivot, the second pivot is to the right of the first pivot. Um, in addition to that, the last pivot, the third pivot, the one occurring in the third row, is to the right of those two pivots. It's in the fifth column. It's far to the right of those other two. So that last example is an example of something that's in echelon form. On the other hand, isn't the second pivot, I mean, the, isn't like the pivots always to the right of like the preceding pivot? If it's, if it's a, if, it, yes. RF, like RRF. Yeah, right, exactly. If it's an echelon form, that's true. But if a matrix is not in this form, then that's not necessarily true. For example, if you take a look at this matrix right here, this matrix is not in echelon form. And the reason has to do with the pivots. Pivots you know, are occurring in non-zero rows. So the first pivot that you see in the first row is the one here. It's in the second column. The second pivot is in the first column. So not in echelon form because, because the first pivot is not, but the second pivot is not to the right of the first pivot. The second pivot is occurring in column one. The first pivot is occurring in column two. So the pivots aren't arranged properly. You're not getting this sort of stair step pattern. It's not in echelon form. Luckily, you can take that last example and make it into something that is in echelon form merely by swapping the first two rows. So if you, if you took the first two rows and just simply switched the order in which they appear, now the thing's in echelon form. In fact, it's the identity matrix. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of facts about echelon matrices that are, that are of interest that we can, that we can show. Um, what I might do is have you show them um, or just explain why that's true. So I'd like people to think about the following questions. So uh, I'll, uh, yeah, so um, the, the statement of interest is right here. And it turns out to be pretty important. If you have a matrix that's in echelon form, then the non-zero rows of U are linearly independent. Even more is true. The columns that contain pivots are also, are also linearly independent. So this is important to remember when we start talking about, about something called uh, the rank the columns, yeah. which contains pivots. I'm sorry? Uh, Professor, yeah, can you talk about uh, 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 why, why is that uh, independent? We yeah, we will talk about that. Yeah, um, in fact, in in the slides, there's there's kind of a proof of it, but I don't I don't want to get to that quite yet. Um, what I'd like people to do, you know, so this is a fact. Um, I'd like people to think about why that's true, maybe through an example. So in the last example, we have, we have an echelon form of a matrix. Um, the rows of the echelon form that we found are linearly independent and the columns are as well. The example that that's referring to is, is this one right here. So if you take a look at this matrix right here, what, what, that, state, what that statement is saying is in this example, the rows of the matrix that row, that row, and that row are linearly independent. It is also saying, so since this guy right here does not contain a pivot, what, what, is, what, it, what that statement that, that, that I'm trying to highlight is also saying is that the first three columns of this matrix are, are, linearly, are linearly independent as well. Now, this matrix involves you know, a lot of weird, a lot of weird, uh, you know, a lot of weird things that you're dividing by, so I don't necessarily want to deal with it directly. Um, I'd like to consider another example. It's around here somewhere. 
So um, right here, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Linear, linear independency doesn't just isn't just about like obtaining non non like non zero trivial solutions. Um, or is that only for like the columns to be linearly independent? So when you say that vectors are linearly independent, what you're seeing, what you're saying is that the only linear combination of those vectors, which adds up to the zero vector is the trivial combination. That's it. Um, so a set of vectors, if, if you, if you look, so I'll, we'll, we'll write down the formal definition in just a second. We've talked about column spaces, but when you're, when you're talking about this type of example, so let's, let, let's sort of see this. Um, maybe more practically, if you because, if you look at yeah, if if, right. if you if you look at this example right here, this matrix, this matrix that that I just circled is an echelon form. The statement that we're making is that the rows which are not zero are linearly independent as vectors. We're also saying that the columns which contain a non-zero pivot are also linearly independent. So we have the matrix 1, 3, 3, 2, 0, 3, 1, followed by 0. So let's write it down and let's see that. So we have the matrix 1, 3, 3, 2. Um, the second row of that matrix, I guess, was of other stuff. Um, zero, zero, three, one, and then you had the zero row. Because what I'm thinking is like, if you have an echelon matrix to like actually show it's linear independent, wouldn't you have to like further row reduce it until you get like? You, you have to do something. So let's just take, Let's just take this example and we'll try it. So we want to show we want to show two things. We want to show that the non-zero rows are linearly independent. And we want to show that the columns which contain non-zero pivots are also linearly independent. Um, just in this example. So let me let me number these. It's one. That's two. Um, so to show one, notice in this example that you only have you only have two non-zero rows. Last row is irrelevant. It's a zero row. So we want to be able to show that that row and that row are linearly independent when considered as vectors. So to that end, you know we write them down as columns rather than rows, just for the sake of convenience. So for one, um, let the set R consist of the vectors one, three, three, two. Um, I need one more, uh, zero, zero, three, one. So to show, that the elements of R are linearly independent, we need to see if we need to see what kind of Of solutions 
we have to the equation C1, 1, 3, 3, 2, plus C2, 0, 0, 3, 1, equal to the zero vector. Um, so if you take that equation, if it turns out, if it turns out that there's a non-trivial solution to that equation, then those two vectors are linearly dependent. If it turns out that the only solution to that equation, that the only solution to that equation is the trivial solution, where C1 is equal to C2 is equal to zero, then we're gonna say that those two vectors are linearly independent. So only one of two things can happen. When we take a look at the situation, so we're going to do an augmented matrix. Or? Yes, that's right. Exactly. Um, when we look at this, exactly. So when we when we look at this, this is equivalent to the system. So you know this equation right here is the same as the equation below it, and. For, for, from the point of view of any kind of practical calculation, what most people are going to do is, is they're simply going to create an augmented matrix and think about that. But the reality is that you don't, um, you know, if you're looking at this, this is pretty much, this is pretty much all you need, right? Because if, if C1 and C2 are represented by those columns, we can immediately see, we can immediately see, we can immediately see from that matrix right there, from just the augmented matrix, we can immediately see that C1 is equal to zero. That's from the first row, right? And this in the third row, is the same in terms of equations as 3C1 plus 3C2 equal to zero, but C1 is zero. So since C1 is zero, we put zero in here and we get 3C2 equal to zero or equivalently C2 is zero. So when we when we take a look at you know whatever types of whatever type of equation is supposed to encode the dependence, we can kind of see pretty much immediately because because the matrix is in is an echelon form, we can immediately forward substitute and solve the system of equations one variable at a time, and and if we do that, we can we can see that the only solution we get is the trivial one. Does that make sense? So those set of two vectors that you're looking at are linearly independent. As, as predicted by, by, by what we're trying to write. Um, the, for, the second, for the second thing, again, it's, it's a similar idea, but it's the shape, it's the shape of the matrix, which is kind of giving you the information we want. So remember that the second thing is that the columns, the columns which contain non-zero pivots are also linearly independent. When you're talking about the columns that contain non-zero pivots, you're looking at columns, you're, you're ignoring you're ignoring columns which do not contain such pivots. So in this example, you have one, two, three, four columns. Only two of those contain non-zero pivots, the first and the third column. So to show something like two, to show that that's true, we just need to show. So we need to show that the set C, when we can't take the first column, that's got a non-zero pivot. When we take the second, when we take the second column, we don't care about that because that, that pivot doesn't contain, a, doesn't contain a pivot at all. The third column does, it's three, three, zero. We just need to show that C consists of, well, I guess I'll just say it this way, is linearly independent set. 
We have to show that C, its elements are linearly independent. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, we proceed in the same way that we just proceeded in one. We look at solutions to the equation. C1, one, zero, zero, plus C2, three, three, zero, equal to the zero vector. Zero vector in this case is three elements. Um, but, but like before, like has been observed before, this amounts to considering this thing, the thing you're looking at as, as a matrix equation. And, and that equation looks a bit like this. It's the columns one, zero, zero, three, three, zero, multiplied by C1, C2 equal to zero, zero, zero. Um, from the point of view of a calculation, what most people are going to do is that they're going to take that system and convert it into some kind of augmented matrix that they will then think about. So what does that augmented matrix actually look like? It looks like 1, 0, 0, 3, 3, 0, and then the solution column is over here. Um, my columns here represent the two variables C1 and C2. But again, the shape the shape of the matrix tells you what you need to know immediately because the second row means that three C2 is zero or equivalently that C2 is zero. The first row means that C1 plus three C2 is zero. But C2 is zero. So since C2 is zero, putting these two facts together, we get that C1 is zero. So again, the shape, the shape, the fact that it's an echelon form allows you to read off what's going on Either through, a th either through forward or back substitution with some kind of matrix, yes? So that's, that's actually the principle that's behind the proof. Um, if you're trying to argue this in general, the general argument is not really that much different than that. It's just observing something. It's just observing something about how the echelon form forces things like this. In the first case, if you're dealing with the non-zero rows, if you arrange these as basically columns in some matrix, you will write down an augmented matrix with a column of zeros on the right. And you will notice through a system of forward substitutions that the various C's that satisfy that homogeneous equation must all be zero. Similarly, similarly, if you're thinking about the, the columns which have non-zero pivots, if you simply arrange them in a matrix, ignoring every column that does not have such a pivot, you will use a system of back substitution to figure out that the only solution is the trivial solution. So that's actually the argument. Um, does anyone have questions about this so far? Turns out that this is an important fact. Um, one more thing I'd like to point out. Um, if you're thinking about a matrix in echelon form, the number of non-zero rows we typically denote, maybe the number of non-zero rows we'll call R, like in the matrix we just saw, there are two of them. The number of non-zero rows is equal to the number of columns with non-zero pivots. Does that make sense? A non-zero pivot can only occur in a non-zero row. And also each non-zero row has exactly one non-zero pivot. Could you like show it? I'm yeah. trying to like visualize it, but. So here's what I'm trying to say, let's just go back to the example. If you take this example here, this guy is in echelon form. It has two non-zero rows. Row one and row two are non-zero. And each non-zero row contains exactly one non-zero pivot. 
So the first row contains that as a pivot. The second row contains that as a pivot. Two non-zero pivots, one in each non-zero row. Here's another example. Wait, um, wouldn't the third, the fourth row? Oh, okay, well, I have two questions. Um, so we sh like we're referring to them as rows and not columns because like rows are horizontal, columns are vertical. So the matrix wow. U that you see has three rows, two of them are non-zero, and it has four columns. Of, of the two of the three rows that you has, two of them are non-zero. Of the four of the four columns that you has, only two contain non-zero pivots, the first column and the last column. A pivot in a non-zero row is, is the first non-zero entry in that row. When you say non-zero row, you just you mean like all the, the entire row has to be zeros. Yeah, oh. a zero row row consisting of entirely zeros. So, okay. so that, that's, that's, all, that's all it means. So here's, here's another example that we can kind of see. Go back up, it's quite a bit here. Um, this matrix that's circled right here, that guy is in echelon form. The matrix that's circled has three rows and it has four columns. Notice you have three non-zero rows all of the rows are non-zero, and they each contain exactly one pivot, one, two, three pivots. The number of non-zero rows corresponds exactly to the number of non-zero pivots that, that, a, that a matrix has. Or another way of saying this, to each non-zero row, there corresponds exactly one column that contains a non-zero pivot, saying the same thing. So, so is, that like, is that like a, a rule that like- Yeah. Non-zero rows, you will have the same amount of non-zero rows equals the same amount of non-zero pivots. Yeah, that's the rule. Okay. Yeah, and and you know you can kind of see it in an echelon matrix. That's what you see, right? So yeah, it's absolutely absolutely a rule. So worth worth remembering. Just another thing to write down. Let's go back. So I think I just erased something. It's okay. Um, probably wasn't important anyway. Um, no, it was important. <laughs> so what I just erased had that had that statement. So um, the the important part of the slide that I just accidentally inadvertently erased, but I'll I'll put it back later. Um, the the important takeaway from that slide, the, the current set of slides with the non erased slider currently on campus. Um, the important point is that the rows, so if the matrix is in echelon form, the non-zero rows of the matrix in echelon form are linearly independent. And the columns, which contain non-zero pivots in an echelon matrix are also linearly independent. Um, the common number that you're talking about we'll call the rank of the matrix. So we'll, we'll write that down uh, I think we wrote that down, you know, yesterday or something like this. But that's that's just a name for it. Um, okay, that's that's what I wanted to say. So if U is in an echelon matrix, then the rows of U are linearly independent, as are the columns. So I guess I should say non-zero right here, but you know you're not adding things at zero anyway. Um, in the last example, we sort of found the echelon matrix. We talked a little bit about why, you know, in the sense of an example, why this is true. Um, we've had a look. We've had a look at the fact that that that's true. But I'd like to just sort of dwell on that for a minute. Does, does anyone have any question? Any further questions about that statement? That statement's important. Now, the number of non-zero rows in an echelon matrix is known as the rank. So, if A is a matrix, and if it reduces to an echelon matrix, which we will call U. The number of non-zero rows in U is called the rank of A. It's also the rank of U. But the rank, the rank of A turns out to be the same as the number of columns in which there is a non-zero pivot. So do, do people follow this so far? And the reason for this is because the number of columns with the non-zero pivot is exactly equal to the number of rows which are not zero in the matrix.
there is a non-zero pivot for each non-zero row. So those, those are important. Statements are important. So the rank of like the one we were looking at would be two. Because yes, two. that's right. That's um, right, exactly. Yeah, there are two, there are two non-zero pivots. There are two non-zero rows in U. There are two columns which contain non-zero pivots. The common number between all of this is two. Rank is two. Um, and, I, and I guess the idea is that you um, came from some matrix that we row reduced in order to get you. Rank is preserved by row operations. So the rank of the original matrix you also call two. So when you're talking about the rank of a matrix which row reduces into something called echelon form, that's usually what you're trying to describe. And so when you're thinking about the rank of a matrix, the rank of a matrix A is equal to the number of non-zero rows in its echelon form. It's just one way to describe it. Um, I don't know right now. So I think I just vaguely said, let's, let's take a look. We're playing around with the example there. I think I just said, let's take a look at this fact. Um, I, don't, I don't actually want to take a look at that fact that carefully. Um, probably want to, want to delay that to tomorrow. Um, how can we see why it's true? We've kind of already seen why this is true, but I don't, I don't really want to talk about this quite yet. Um, it involves quite a bit of, quite a bit of symbolism. Um, so I kind of want to move beyond that right now. Um, again, when you're thinking about this type of example, we're talking about exactly this. If this is the matrix A, its echelon form is the U that we're talking about. Um, in this example, we're going to say that the rank of A is two. Um, so that's just that's just what we'll call it. Yes, go ahead. There's a question. Um, can you go back the page there when we have the example? Yeah. The rank right here. Two. Um, yeah. Like. Um, suppose we have a matrix like A, yeah. And first thing we do we just row reduce, right? Yeah. And but before we row reduce, we normally use um, Gauss Jordan. You could use Gauss Jordan, but up how do a, we up, know up, up to a point? Can, okay. Yeah, okay. and so the the only difference. So what what I would say is the only difference between what you're describing and moving from A to U right here amounts to multiplying this row by one third and then eliminating the three above it. There's no way to get rid of that three at all because there's no, there's no non-zero pivot that you could use to eliminate it. So when you're talking about row reduced echelon form, what you would do is you would produce a one right here and then you would eliminate the three above it. Does that make sense? So it's not necessary to reduce a three, okay. Not if all you're interested in is rank. Um, sometimes it's easier to solve systems of equations when the thing is in Gauss-Jordan. And if you want to know what an inverse is, you would use Gauss-Jordan. But if all you're interested in is the rank of a matrix, all you got to do is to produce a, an, an echelon form of that matrix using some very simple elementary operations, elementary row operations. And, you know, so if you take a matrix like A, all you really need to know about that matrix A, if, you, if all you're interested in is the rank, is what it reduces to in terms of U. What you see in U are, are two non-zero rows and a zero row. Two non-zero rows, rank two. Notice also with U, you have a column here and a column here. Both of those columns contain non-zero pivots and all other columns don't when you're talking about U. There's a significance to this when we when we begin to talk about the column space in just a second, maybe in just a second. But are you are you with me so far? Yeah. Is it good? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So when we think um, when we think back to this example, um, I'd like to say maybe let's see where where are we? About right there. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this. And I think we probably in some sense have already done it. Um, so this is basically just an example of what we talked about before, just writing it down. Um, the equation UC equal to zero encodes an independence relation. Um, if you're taking a look at the columns, um, 
you know, are they linearly independent or not? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, in our usual formulations, C2 and C4 are free variables. So I'd like to spend, you know, a couple of minutes just dwelling on this. But if you talk about U for a minute, we already know that the first and the third column are linearly independent. Um, what does that say about the other two columns? Um, so the question, and I'd like to ask this about you. So here's a question. Are the columns, are all the columns of you linearly independent? We know that the first and the third column are because we've just shown them. So the next couple of slides are meant to address this, but before I sort of show them, do people, do people understand what I'm trying to ask? I'm talking about the column space of you. So when you're talking about you, it's certainly true that the first and the third columns are linearly independent. We checked that. We can ask the question, are all the columns of you linearly independent? Now, if we're just talking about the column space of U, um, the column space of U is certainly spanned by those four vectors. Any vector in the column space is by definition a linear combination of those four vectors. We're asking whether or not that set of four vectors is minimal. So let's see. So with the following, with the following slide, maybe there's, there's an explanation. Um, the equation uc equal to zero encodes any dependence relation. We're investigating whether or not the columns are linearly independent. We get the equation of vectors that looks like this. So in our usual formulation, um, c2 and c4 are free variables because the columns associated with those variables do not contain pivots, non-zero pivots. So you can write the second column of u as a linear combination of row one and three. So to see this, Put the free variable C2 equal to one, put C4 equal to zero. And you're gonna get that C1 is three, C2 is one. Of course, those two, those two are what they are. If you do something like this, all that really does is it writes that second column as a combination of that column and that column. We put C4 is equal to zero in the dependence relation. So if C4 is zero, we're killing that last column we're only interested in that column right there. Put that equal to one, put that equal to zero. The question is what should the C1 and the C3 be in order to express that column? It turns out that you can solve that equation if C1 is equal to three, if C2 is equal to one, then, then the combination that, that we're talking about is equal to the vector three, zero, zero. Um, so again, it's not maybe totally clear what I'm trying to what I'm trying to do here, but what I'm saying is that the fact that we have a dependence relation, I can use that dependence relation to try to write the second column as a linear combination of the first and the third column. You don't actually have to do it this way, but it's a reasonable way of doing it. Um, so probably I'll say a little bit more about that next time. I probably should say what I'm trying to get out here. When we go back to the matrix U right here, the answer to this question, are the columns of U linearly independent? The answer to this question is no. Only column one and column three are. It turns out That column two and column four can be written. As linear combinations, both as linear combinations of columns one and three. So to, to, to sort of summarize this, this exercise that we're doing, it's trying to get a handle on what the basis 
on what the basis for the column space of that matrix U actually is. We know by definition that the set of columns of U span the column space. So if you just wrote down all of those vectors, you would wind up with a basis for the column space of U. The next question that, that is reasonable to ask is, is that set of vectors minimal? Are there any vectors you can throw out? Well, we already know that columns one and three are linearly independent because we checked that. Um, the question is columns two and columns four, do you really need them? The answer to that question is if you're only interested in the column space, you don't. You can write column two as a linear combination of columns one and three. You can write column four as a linear combination of columns one and three. So if the matrix is an, is an echelon form like this is, the only columns that you need in order to describe the column space are the columns that contain non-zero pivots. And all the slides that follow are doing is explaining how you might come up with the linear combinations. So that's the, they're just calculations, but that's the idea behind those slides. So we're just trying to, in this example, get a handle on how to describe the column space. Um, that's one of the three or four important subspaces of a matrix, of a, of a vector space defined by a matrix that we need to study. The column space of the matrix is somehow associated with the range of a matrix when you're considering it as a function. The column space you want to be able to, in a fairly concise way, describe it using a minimal number of basis vectors, using a minimal set. So it's called a basis. The column space is always the space spanned by the columns of the matrix. Sometimes the columns of the matrix, you get too many vectors and if you just sort of list them all, you can write some columns as linear combinations of other columns. When a matrix is an echelon form, it turns out that any column that does not contain a non-zero pivot can be expressed as a linear combination of the columns that contain the non-zero pivots. It's just an example. So what we're saying is that we, we don't need to include, in order to understand the column space, we don't, of, 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 a, of a matrix in echelon form, we don't need to include all of the columns. All we've got to do is include the columns which contain non-zero pivots. So that's what those slides, the next few slides are all about. Right now is kind of, I think, a reasonable stopping place. We'll pick up on this tomorrow. Um, there's an assignment, I think, that's due later today. I think it comes from both yesterday and today. There's some description of linear independence and dependence there. So it's worth doing. Um, we'll continue to talk about this tomorrow. It's, it's kind of a deep conversation. There's a lot to talk about. The slides are dense. So we're gonna move through them slowly. We'll fill in with examples. Um, but remember, remember, the whole point of the exercise, we're gonna describe the idea of a basis. We're gonna describe the notion of dimension in these cases. Um, but the goal over the next couple of hours, the next few days of the course, is to come up with a description through a basis, through a minimal set of vectors that span the subspace of the, of the null space of a matrix, but we kind of already know how to do that, of the column space of the matrix, which we're kind of beginning to understand here, of the row space of the matrix, which we haven't talked about quite yet. And then there's one more, there's one more subspace that we'll talk about called the left null space. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that until next week sometime. The goal is to understand how do you write down a basis of these various subspaces and what can you say about them in relation to each other. So that's sort of the exercise. That's what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. Right now, we really only have a firm grasp of the null space of the matrix where we're pretty confident that we can easily write down a basis for the null space. Um, we're beginning to talk about the column space of an echelon matrix. It turns out that when you go back to this example, and again, we'll go back and study this example pretty carefully, when you take the matrix that we've got and you compare it to the matrix that it came from, the matrix A, there is a relationship between the column spaces, but it's not the obvious one. Um, but we'll talk about that tomorrow, at least through that example. Um, and at some point, we actually have to write down exactly what a basis and dimension are in the general case. But you know, tomorrow we'll do that as well, I think. So before we move on, do you have any questions or concerns? We really only know how to do one thing well, write down a basis of the null space. 
we have a sense that we can write down the basis of the column space as the collect of, of, the, of an echelon matrix merely by writing down the vectors that merely by writing down the column vectors that contain non-zero pivots. That's kind of where we are right now. We're not talking yet about column spaces of matrices which are not in echelon form that will come tomorrow. Um, but that's kind of where we're at right now, at least with the examples. So are people with me so far? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's a good time to end. Um, it's noon. Um, I'll have office hours a bit later today as usual um, from one to two. Um, keep working on things. If you have any questions, let me know. And uh, have, uh, have a good day.